Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Brad Olson joins us. We're going to talk about some of the strange things happening on the planet. His passion for writing goes far beyond his book publishing business or the online content he produces. He is also the founder and event producer of the How Weird Street Fair in San Francisco. That's where he currently resides. And between writing online and print publication articles, new book chapters, and posting on social media, he also manages various websites, does marketing work, special sales fulfillment, and manages various projects which outsource collaborators and produces one of the largest festivals in the city. Now, wearing his publisher's hat, he makes the stated goal of only releasing the kinds of books that he would value owning himself, which incorporates thought-provoking and critical content and a wide appeal to readers. His book publishing business is called CCC Publishing, distributed by Independent Publishers Group. Brad Olson, back on Coast to Coast. Brad, how have you been? Hey there, George. I'm doing great. Great to be on Coast to Coast and talk with you again. I just came back from the country Laos, oh, just a little over a day ago, and I was over there for about three weeks working on an article about the megalithic site called the Plain of Jars, and... I was also investigating the secret war in Laos, which took place concurrently during the Vietnam War. And surprisingly, there's a connection between the two. Now, these jars, are, they have stone jars. Tell us about this. What, what's their purpose? Well, really fascinating. I've known about these for many years, and I finally had the opportunity to go out there. It's quite a remote location in northeastern Laos. And there's 135 remaining jars. Each one's about two meters tall, which is pretty big. That's about the size I am, and I'm a tall guy. One of the jars is over three meters tall. It's towering over me, and they're buried in the ground. But they're built during the Iron Age, which was in Laos and Southeast Asia, around 500 B.C. to 500 A.D. So they're about 2,500 years old. And you can still see the chip marks that were made carved out of sandstone and composite stone and even granite. They carved these amazing jars with lids on them and rims around the top. And it's been a mystery for a long time what they could have been used for. Do we have any idea? Well, there is a good idea. And that is because funerary objects, as well as cremated and skeletal remains, had been found in and around some of the jars by a archaeologist named Colani, a French archaeologist who was out there in the 1930s who did an extensive study of the plain of jars and determined that they were basically funerary urns, but not the kind of funerary urn that you would think of that we have. They're called secondary burial process, where deceased body would be placed in there and they would stay in there until the body was basically decomposed to bone. Oh, my god! And then the bones were removed and then reburied. I guess in some of those big jars, you could stiff a body in there. Oh, you sure could. That's why they're so big. Laos was a problem spot like Vietnam, wasn't it? Oh, it sure was, George. And even though we never declared war or made any notion that we were fighting the Laotian people... It became the most heavily bombed country in the world. And some of those unexploded ordinances or UXOs are still vexing the population today. Did any of these uh, weaponries hit the Plain of Jars sites? Because they had lots of sites out there. They sure did. And then that's the connection with the Plain of Jars and the Secret War in Laos. Because the Secret War in Laos started in 1964. It was not even mentioned to Congress or the American people for six years. The Plain of Jars happens to be on this high plateau in Laos, 
where an ancient crossroads had taken place. That's why the jars were created, because there were wealthy merchants who probably paid for these funerary urns to be there. Because it's such a crossroad in the whole Southeast Asian area, it was also the Ho Chi Minh Trail during the Vietnam War, where supplies were being funneled from North Vietnam through Laos and then down to South Vietnam to confront the Americans. And what is known as the Second Indochina War, which we know as the Vietnam War. So that's why Laos was just carpet bombed from top to bottom. More bombs were dropped on Laos than all the bombs in World War II, George. Jeez. It's just incredible. Oh Are things calm there now, Brad? Oh, very calm there now, and the people of Laos are just so friendly. They're among the friendliest people I've ever met. There's no hard feelings whatsoever, and although I felt uneasy at times going to some of the UXO museums and checking out what had happened during the secret war in Laos, of course, it was way before my time, but even when I was in Vietnam in 1993, I went to the Museum of American War Atrocities, And when you see things from the opposite side, it kind of paints an entirely different picture than what we learned in our history school. Times sure are changing, aren't they, Brad? They are changing, and and I think people have uh, started to just live and learn and, and let go. But I'll tell you, George, out on the Plain of Jars are still pockmarked with big craters from the bombing campaigns. And the jars themselves were even used in defensive postures in the first Indochina War with the French during the War of Independence. They were actually hiding in the jars, and there are still trenches around the area that they were using as fortifications. How advanced were the ancient Laotians? Well, in the time of the Iron Age, they were advanced enough to create megalithic jars and the shields that some people thought were used as covering for the jars. They were actually covering gravestones for some of the more important people. It's kind of like if you go to a 19th century graveyard, the rich people have big mausoleums for their family or very ornate funerary ornaments. That's basically what the jars were. They were just basically for a family unit and multi-generations were buried there. The poor were basically cremated and also buried on the plain of jars. So it was a big funerary complex. Did they dump the ashes in the jars? Sometimes they were in the jars. Oftentimes they were just buried in other locations around the plain. But there are many locations. It's not just one central location. All of them are a World Heritage Site now. Some are up in the jungle. Others are on other hilltops. But the one most tourists go to and the one I went to with the World Heritage Museum on site, that has about a hundred jars. It's by far the biggest. Are they sprinkled all over the place, Brad? Yeah, they sure are. It took me a good half day to explore the whole site, including a cave that they used for the crematorium, which is also on site and where people would hide from the bombing campaigns as well. I looked at one picture of a site of a jar, and it looks like it's buried and dug out in the ground. Is that what they had on some of them? Yeah, and I think over time, just like on Easter Island, some of those megaliths just kind of sink into place. But some of those jars were destroyed in the bombing campaign and the secret war on Laos. Some just obliterated, others broken into pieces and scattered all around. What's the material they're made out of? Rocks? Yeah, they're just carved straight out of sandstone boulders. And this is the big mystery of the megaliths in Laos, George, is they know where the quarries were, but they had to travel over 20 kilometers to get to the Plain of Jars. And how they actually move those megaliths is the big mystery surrounding them, that they're so big and so heavy, must have used a whole lot of manpower, but going up and down valleys over creeks and through dense jungle foliage to get to their locations. I'm told, and you mentioned the bombs that never went off during the 60s and 70s, that there might be close to 80 million unexploded bombs in Laos. Just lying around, and unfortunately kids will be poking around and uh, watch the film at the UXO Museum in Luang Prabang, a beautiful World Heritage City 200 kilometers away. And boy, the just the horror stories you see of 
children that just got maimed from it and a father who lost an arm and isn't able to provide for his family. This is still an ongoing issue, but they are doing a good job in educating kids to stay away from them and doing bomb clearing in many areas, mostly along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was the most heavily mm-hmm. bombed tract of land in the world. Is there anything paranormal about these jars, Brad? Well, no, there is. And there's a legend that they were built by giants and used by giants as cups. So there's good legends that tie in to ancient prehistoric giants, and there's a tie-in there between many of those sites around the world. These huge jars might have been like glasses for giants. Can you imagine three foot tall, weighing several tons, and just drinking? Yeah. Brad, what was the reason you went to Laos? Was it to look for the plant of jars, or was there another reason? Well, I was on an assignment for World Explorer magazine that's produced by David Hatcher Childress of Ancient Aliens. Sure. And he's very interested in all the megalithic curiosities around the world. They've never done an article on that. So I was invited to the ASEAN Tourism Forum in Ventian, Laos, the capital. So I took the opportunity to go out there to the Plain of Jars on an overnight bus. Oh boy, the roads are really rutted. It's like they're still suffering from the bombing campaigns. When you talk about megalithic, what do you talk about? Well, it basically means anything made out of stone on a very large scale. And these megaliths on the Plain of Jars certainly qualified. Several of them routinely weigh over several tons. So they're just enormous. Aren't there some that are underwater? Well, that's another subject that I'm exploring about underwater archaeology. And that's a really fascinating subject because... How do you create a megalithic construction underwater? This is a very good case for ancient civilizations once existing on this planet. Might this have been the flood of Noah that inundated it? Well, there would have had to have been some kind of major Earth cataclysm to sink these megaliths lower than the ocean level, whether that was the biblical flood or a pole shift scenario or just a massive earthquake. There are some underwater archaeology that are of a more modern age. For example, Herclanium off of the Nile Delta in Egypt was long rumored to have been a city that sunk during a major earthquake event and has just recently been uncovered. Similarly, on the other side of the Mediterranean, a Caesarean complex also collapsed during an earthquake, and that too can be discovered underwater. But the fascinating ones, like the megalithic sites, are much, much older. Tell us about the pre-Incan people. Well, this is getting into the megaliths of South America, because even every archaeologist and every historian would agree that the site of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, which is one of the most fascinating megalithic sites in the world, so precisely built, I'm sure you've had many guests on talking about that, Especially Eric Von Doniken. Oh, yeah. Well, he is the godfather of ancient astronaut theory. Yeah, it was in his book, The Chariot of the Gods, which so many of us were turned on to many of these mysteries, and now is the whole franchise called Ancient Aliens. But Puma Punku is widely regarded as pre-Incan. So there was a high technology in South America that the Incans took a page out of their playbook and then built upon these megaliths. Now, I was down there five years ago with Brian Forrester and the Sim Harriman and several others on a tour of the megalithic sites, and routinely you could see the really big, the really finely built megaliths with inferior constructions on top, which were the Incan constructions, and then the more inferior Spanish designs on top of those. They just kept building upon old foundations. In fact, a city called Oyete Tambo, which is the gateway to Machu Picchu, it's where you catch the train or you could start a trek to Machu Picchu. Brian Forrester said it's the oldest continuously inhabited location in the world, and it's thousands of years old. Now, is this where the elongated skull story comes from? Yeah, and it's more than just a story, George. We went to a museum where they just have these elongated skulls on display to the South American people. It's just a part of their heritage or history, and they're 
unabashed, unashamed to show them off. And they're quite unique. I got to tell you, George, there's nothing quite like seeing one of these elongated skulls because they're human-like, but they're not quite human because you got to see it to believe it. You got to see the pictures and even the reconstruction of what these elongated look like because they're not quite like us. They don't have the central suture crack through the skull. Their cranial capacity is 30% bigger than ours, and they've got eye sockets that are also 30% bigger. So they're just not homo sapiens. They're something else. Some people say the mothers of these children elongated their skulls under some kind of tradition. I'm not sure about that. I think they were born that way. I think they're hybrids or something. Well, they were, because there's no way you can add 30% brain cranial capacity by wrapping a head or putting a board on it. Yeah, it is a common practice around the world. We have them here in North America. They're called the Flathead Indians up in Idaho, and they practice cranial deformation. So you can move the head around in different shapes, but you can't add brain mass. Tell us about your trips to Antarctica. Boy, was that a trip. Getting down there was one of the hardest endeavors I've ever been on. And I've been to all seven continents now, but crossing the Drake Passage, boy, oh boy, got violently seasick for three days. I think I lost about 25 pounds on that trip. Talk about a crash diet if you do want. It's a good way to lose a lot of weight. Even people on the cruise ships, 50% of them get seasick on that trip. And we were on a sailboat. What a trip that was. Yeah, but once we got there, boy, I got to tell you, it's one of the most unusual locations in the world. It's just a frozen land where glaciers will just come right down to the ocean. We saw the calving of breaking off glaciers and big tidal waves that are a result when they hit the water. So first you see them and it's like a big dust of snow and then they come crashing down. Then you hear it and then you see the waves coming across the bay and you have to right the boat directly into the waves to ride it out because if it hits you on the side it could swamp a boat how do you literally get down there brad well there's three ways you can always fly down there but that's quite expensive you can fly and pick up a cruise ship but most people get on a boat out of the southernmost city in the world called ushuaia argentina and that's what we did after our drive down through argentina and chile I bought a car in Santiago and then eventually sold it four months later. But we left it just in Ushuaia and uh, got tipped off that you can get on a sailboat. And we did and got passage with one other Americans and 11 Polish sailors on a boat called the Chief One for a 26-day excursion. And once we were down there, just to paint a little picture of what it's like, it's just this frozen landscape of very dramatic cliffs and mountains. If you've ever been to the Maroon Bells outside of Aspen, Colorado, it it quite reminded me of that. Just such dramatic mountainscapes with glaciers and ice all over it. But the wildlife down there was so unusual because they have no fear of humans. You could be right up next to a seal or a penguin. Hmm. We even had a whale swim under our boat. It was quite unique to see animals that close up. Why no fear? They don't know what a human is, or they probably do. Some of the whales almost got hunted to extinction, the blue whale and the right whale, but their generations after it might not have any knowledge of that. They just never see humans. They never see ships. So they're quite as curious in us as we were in them. Just We're just looking at each other like, oh, wow, look, (laughs) right up close. What would you say, Brad, is one of the strangest aspects of Antarctica? As far as I know, I'm the only researcher in this field who went down there to look specifically for all of this paranormal or UFO-related stories that we hear about down there. Every research station I went to, even when we were in Ushuaia talking to other sea captains and crew members, said, do you know anything about the three massive motherships that are supposedly poking out through the ice? And they've been known by the intelligence community since the 1970s are nicknamed Nina Pinta and Santa Maria. And in my presentation on Antarctica, I do pinpoint one of them that I think is quite possibly one of those motherships. 
I was also asking about antediluvian civilizations. How about these pyramids that appear to be poking through the ice or any kind of megalithic structures you know of? And routinely, I just came into the same answer as no, we don't know about that. Not to say that they were covering it up, but probably they just don't know. Because a lot of the people at these research stations are just down there with a specific purpose to study the ice fish or look at the changes that are happening in the climate. And indeed, they are happening down there at a rapid pace. But some areas of Antarctica are heating up and there's clearly a change in the climate. There are other areas in Antarctica that are actually getting colder and accumulating ice. And this is perhaps why we don't see the dramatic sea level rises around the world. Back in the uh, mid-1400s, early 1500s, there was an Ottoman navigator by the name of Perry Rees. Tell us about the map that is so controversial. Oh, one of the greatest maps ever created, which clearly showed the European western continent of Iberia with Africa just below it, and then the outline of South America. Now, this is just a mere 21 years after Columbus's first voyage to the New World. But what's so fascinating about the Piri Reef map is that it shows the coastline of Antarctica, including some islands that have yet to be discovered. As if, the, as if it would be thought out, right? As if it was drawn, and it even says in the liner notes of the Perry Reese map that it comes from source maps that date all the way back to the Library of Alexandria. Graham Hancock featured that on Ancient Apocalypse series, saying that these maps were so old that they were drawn before Antarctica had ice, that it would have been before even the last ice age. Well, that's the only way they would have been able to see the landmass, right? Well, that's right. And when we were down at the Palmer Station, it was pointed out to us that there was an island just offshore. It's now called Pie Island because the ice bridge connecting it to Anvers Island collapsed on Pie Day, which is May 14th, 3.14. On that date, they realized here's an island that we never knew existed. So indeed, new land masses are still being discovered down there. Did you see many troops down there? No, because of the Antarctica Treaty, which was fully ratified in 1961, there are no troops allowed to be down there. We did see a Coast Guard ship, and in the event of an emergency, they are allowed to fly in, say, for an emergency evacuation or to bring supplies to the bases. But per the Antarctic Treaty, no military activity or exploding of ordinances is permitted. Are there any indigenous people living there? No, and there never has been. That's why Antarctica was only discovered in 1820 by sealers and whalers who had read the account of Captain Cook who fully sailed around Antarctica but never discovered it, never knew it was there. And so I do another presentation about the ancient maps of the Sea Kings and show the Captain Cook map when he got back to the British Academy and said, nope, we didn't find that landmass, which had been on all these other older maps like the Perry Reef map. And so suddenly Antarctica disappears, but then it reappears when it is discovered in 1820. Who made the map? Well, maps were often copied by other map makers, cartographers, which were the most prized possession on any ship. So the first thing a pirate would do when they capture a ship, they'd break into the lockbox of the captain and steal their maps. That was more prized than even the gold and the other booty that they could get off of a stolen ship. And then those maps were reproduced very carefully to represent the land masses. Now, isn't it interesting that how we say you read a map, but really there's not many words on there. There's place name words, but you're reading the lines. Yeah, you're reading the pictures of a map. Brad Olson, he's got several books, too, including Beyond Esoteric, Escaping Prison Planet, Modern Esoteric, Future Esoteric. These are books that came out simultaneously. Sacred Places of North America as well. Brad, tell us about CCC Publishing. Did you start that company? Yeah, I sure did, George. Almost 30 years ago, I started as a travel writer 
and did a number of books you mentioned. But things were changing around the time of the advent of the Internet, early 2000s. And that is, you can just get online and basically find all the information you want on an upcoming trip. So I kind of went into an existential crisis in a way and decided that uh, what I really wanted to write about was the things that really interested me, such as these mysterious or esoteric subjects that you can't routinely find online. And right. it's worked out well in my esoteric series of books. And I also published books by Michael Jaco, Leo Lyonzagami, Lon Milo Duquette, and soon Laura Eisenhower's first book will be coming out called Awakening oh, good the Truth Frequency. It is exciting. She's a very good speaker, as you know, at all the conferences that we attend. What do you think of the stories in the Bible? I didn't really grow up studying them. i got to tell you, I've seen so many parallels to what's going on in the world. So we spoke about the Great Flood and the possibility of Earth cataclysms, but also how the giants are mentioned in the Bible and other ancient literature. So I think that there's a pretty good kernel of truth in many of the Old Testament ancient stories that are reproduced in the Bible. Brad, what would you say might be one of the most fascinating places you have witnessed? From the Great Pyramids of Egypt, which when you see them for the first time, there's nothing like the pyramids in the world. There really isn't. And I I took a uh, horse trip ride when I was there in 1993 down to the Step Pyramid of Saqqara. And all along the way, you find the remnants of crumbled pyramids and other sites that just didn't hold up to the test of time like the pyramids do. And then you look back and you see them from 10 or 15 miles away, and they're just these perfectly geometrical structures, the only lasting ancient site of the ancient world that still exists. What are your thoughts of extraterrestrial life? Well, in my book, Future Esoteric, it's mostly about all the evidence there is about extraterrestrials. George, you know, if one UFO sighting was authentic, and I think we realize many are authentic, it changes everything, everything we know about. So this is truly the most important subject that anybody could endeavor to research because it has the potential to completely change the world we live in. All you need is one crop formation to be done by some ETs or some supernatural way. That's all, just one. Yeah, and that's a world changer. Thanks for having me on. Great talking to you again. You take care of yourself. I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.